And welcome to our Uncommon Church community. I'm so glad that you are worshiping with us. When you worship with First Parish, there are three things I hope for you. I hope that you experience God. I hope you have a chance to get to know your neighbor a little better. And I hope that when we're done, you are inspired to live love. Please know that the church office is open and the staff is ready to serve you. The best way to reach us is by phone at 207-846-3773. You can call or text that number. You can also find more information on our website at firstparishyarmouth.org. When we gather for worship at First Parish, we recognize that every person we meet provides us with an opportunity to know God more fully. I invite you at this time to greet those around you with the peace of Christ. If you're watching by yourself, send someone a text or an email or make a phone call later. The peace of Christ be with you. I have two announcements today. Uh, first, today we enter into the stewardship season, which marks the start of our annual pledge campaign. If you've not already done so, please take the time to review the April newsletter. It tells the story of where we've been throughout the past year and how we're feeling called to live, serve, and love in the year ahead. And then next Saturday, uh, yeah, next Sunday afternoon, April 18th, we will host an earth care and self-care event. Members and friends of all ages are invited to the first parish lawn from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. to paint clay pots, plant succulents, and take part in other earth care and self-care activities. The rain date for this event is Sunday, April 25th. Please contact Jamie with any questions. Spring is beginning. Many more people are getting vaccinations. Last week was Easter, a time of hope. Yet the weather is still cold and overcast. And I'm reminded of a poem by Celia Thaxter, Thaxter who lived on the Isle of Shoals in New Hampshire in the 1800s. This is a portion of her poem called Spring Again. Frost locked, storm-beaten, lonely. In the midst of wintry main, our bleak rock, yet the tidings heard, there shall be spring again. With all the waiting and watching, the woe that winter wrought was the passion of gratitude that shook my soul at the blissful thought. Soft rain and flowers and sunshine, sweet winds in brooding skies, Quick, quick flitting birds to fill the air with clear, delicious cries. And the warm sea's mellow murmur, resounding day and night, a thousand shapes and tints and tones of manifold delight. Nearer, ever nearer, drawing with every day, but a little longer to wait and watch neath skies so cold and gray. And hushed is the roar of the bitter north, before the might of spring. In up the frozen slope of the world climbs summer triumphing. And so we begin. I invite you to take a deep breath and to center yourself. Let us be the church at worship.
join me in the spirit of prayer? Jesus, the light of your love shines on, illuminating the places where you are present. As the bewildered disciples pondered the stories of your appearance, you penetrated the darkness of their fear and doubt with your word of peace. You showed them the appalling marks of evil pierced on your hands and feet. You opened their minds to understand how death could not defeat you. Increase our understanding, we pray, and open our minds and hearts to receive you, Lord. Speak your word of peace to us, and let your love shine on any dark areas in our lives. Amen. This morning we kick off our annual stewardship campaign. Uh, Many of you have received quite a bit of information about this by email and newsletters in the mail. And this morning, uh, Meg O'Neill and Binks Colby George, our co-moderators, are offering reflections to help us start this season of giving. Hello. Binks Colby George here, and it is that time again, time for our annual First Parish Church Stewardship Campaign. You may be asking, what is stewardship? Well, I would tell you I've seen stewardship defined as responsibility for the blessings that we have. Great. So what does that all mean? Well, our blessings include our talents, our time, as well as our finances. And responsibility for these blessings means that you care for them and you share them with others. At First Parish Church, people share talent, 
such as the many musical offerings that we have or the construction skills that our volunteers use. People share their time, such as working on church committees or going on mission trips. And people share their money, which allows First Parish Church to function and to share blessings inside and outside of Yarmouth. So why do I give? I give because I am able to. I have been the recipient of many blessings in my life, people who have taken the time to share their skills and teach me things, to listen to my problems and my accomplishments, and to help me when I have struggled to overcome an obstacle. I am now at a place in my life where I can do this for others in return. I have the time to serve on church boards. I have talents to share, and I have money to give. And I give because I am called to. God's love is everywhere, and I am an agent of that love. By living out who I want to be, I bring myself closer to my own spiritual path. Cultivating my blessings allows me to grow and to interact with others, and it helps me to see God in them and to recognize God in me. So, why do I give my blessings to First Parish Church? In First Parish, I have found a community that allows me to share my blessings with others who are also on a spiritual journey and to collectively amplify the reach of our resources. My time, talents, and finances are brought together with others to achieve many goals and opportunities that I would have never thought possible. As one of my professors in college frequently used to say, we all do better when we all do better. By sharing my time, talents, and finances with First Parish Church, I help to make our community better as I make myself better. Please consider your own blessings and what you can offer to the community. Thank you. Ask Binks and me, in preparation for our 2021 stewardship campaign to share why we chose to serve and give to First Parish, I thought it would be an easy few minutes to fill. The truth is, I struggle to put into words the reason I choose to give. My reasons are layered and woven, and in some ways, words seem inadequate to convey how I feel. As many of you know, I grew up in this church, both literally and figuratively. I was baptized here, confirmed here, and married in our beautiful sanctuary. I've celebrated and mourned family and friends sitting on our warm wooden pews, holding our red hymnals and Bibles, still by our stenciled walls. Along with you throughout the years, I've prayed for clarity, hoped for understanding, and asked forgiveness. In many ways, First Parish has been a steadfast life partner during the wobbly years of my youth when the walls were a lime green hue and the stairs to Sunday school were steep and creaky, First Parish offered my family community, a place a large family could rest and fidget and pray. During my teen years, when I felt awkward and longed to belong, First Parish's youth group made me feel at home and that I mattered. Not many years later, it was also here where I was not afraid to question God, resist my faith, or begin a personal path of discernment. 53 years later, and I realized that though I dearly love the building where we pray and listen and sing together, it is not the building itself that has held me. It is the people and our collective commitment to help create, protect, and preserve a peaceful, just, and loving world. It is Peter's Sunday evening happy hours that I've yet to attend. It is Liz, Dale, Irv, Donna, Tom, Carrie, Scott, Brenda, Ray, Nancy, Jen, Warren, Julie, Lee, Paul and Mary, Sean, Kristen, Craig and Eileen, Cindy and Joe. It is your hands and the work you do on Clamfest, Christmas Fair, Easter service. It is the steady voices of Sue, Dominique, Seth, the Jims. It is riches and arts and Bill's commitment to the earth. It is women together and the men's group, Bible study and the choir. It is our confirmands and their leaders. It is Mike and Laura and Pam. It is our mission groups and, and our knitters and quilters. It is Sharon and Mary and Ruth. It is Judy's, Peter's, and Bob's teaching and Bing's shepherding. It's Sue's commitment and the trustees, council, and deacons watching over us. It is those I don't know and those that have yet to arrive. 
It is our youth from the babies that sweetly, sweetly cry out to the confirmands that courageously question. It's Gabby and Nate, Jack and Mandy and Evan and Amanda and their music. It's those who have come before and made grace for us. Val and Gwen and Beth and Mary Estelle, Judy, John, and so many more. It's Kate and Jamie, Wendy, Katie, and Carrie. The names could flow on and on. It's all of you. In the end, I give because I'm better with you beside me. I'm stronger and kinder and more aware with you walking next to me. You give me hope. You push me to think outside myself. You make me bigger than I am alone. Your voices lift me up. I give because I believe in us. Good morning. Today's scripture is from the book of John, chapter 20. And it is a continuation of Jesus' ministry after his death and his resurrection. And in order to really fully understand it, you need to know that it takes place between his death and his ascension. And that in this period, there was great trauma, fear, and uncertainty, anxiety. In fact, his disciples were hiding. Uh, they were meeting secretly in this passage. So, um, so Jesus does come and appear to his disciples in the passage. And one of the phrases that he uses several times is, peace be with you. And the reason I see that as significant is because that was a very conventional, kind of a normal greeting um, during those times. And I think that Jesus was trying to settle down his disciples because they were so fearful try to settle them down and have kind of more of a normal conversation with them. So there's a lot happening in the passage I'm going to read. And one of the things that happens there is he commissions his disciples to go out and continue his ministry after he's gone. And he conveys power on them kind of symbolically by breathing on them. Another thing that happens in the passage is the story of Thomas. And most of you probably know the story as Doubting Thomas. And in that part of the story, Thomas must see for himself that Jesus has risen. And we learn in in listening to this story 
that many of us um, must also see the truth for ourselves. We must touch it. We must see it. And Jesus responds very lovingly to, to Thomas, and it shows that there's love for all of us, even if we're doubting. So I will read John chapter 20, verses 19 through 30. And on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the same house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. May these words inspire us and light our path forward. Amen. A recent article in the Portland Press Herald talked about cave syndrome, a fear of re-entering the world. The article states, quote, 48% of vaccinated adults said they still felt uneasy, end quote. Dr. Julie Holland, a New York psychiatrist, is quoted saying, there's no question it's easier to learn to be afraid than to be unafraid. I wonder if the disciples have the beginning stages of cave syndrome when we catch up with them this week. They've been through a traumatizing event. The person who they thought would deliver them, the person that they thought would be their literal savior, was brutally murdered right before their very eyes. So not only have they lost their leader, but they have to come face to face with the very real danger of following in his ways. And so I imagine the disciples sitting together, huddled in a house with the doors locked, trembling with fear, scared to go out as they could meet the same fate as Jesus, and also being racked with grief and probably guilt over Jesus' death. And in the midst of their fear, Jesus appears to them. Now remember, the disciples failed at pretty much every turn in the events leading up to Jesus' death. They deny knowing him. They don't try to save him. They hide, turn away, run away. And now Jesus appears to them. I'm guessing they might expect that Jesus would be angry and disappointed, that he might scold them for failing. But that's not what he does. Jesus simply says, peace be with you. He reminds them that their call is to go out into the world. He reminds them that they do not go out alone. The Holy Spirit goes with them. Peace be with you. And so they go out and do amazing things, right? 
I mean, Jesus appeared, told them to go out into the world. He told them that they don't go alone. It's a little like offering them a vaccine. It's okay, disciples. You need to get back out there. You need to be unafraid. Except it seems they don't actually leave the house. The next thing we know, a week later, Thomas visits them, maybe checking on them since they are too afraid to leave the house, and they tell him about their encounter with Jesus. And Thomas can't quite believe what they are saying. Now, there are a lot of ways to consider this passage, but this is the approach I appreciated this week. Listen to these questions raised by the pulpit fiction commentary. Where was Thomas the first time Jesus appeared? And what did the disciples do for eight days after they received the Holy Spirit and were still locked in the room? The disciples are passive in these stories. They have no real response. Except for Thomas, who declares, My Lord, my God. He is the only one who makes the stark confession to Jesus' resurrection. End quote. It seems Thomas didn't lock himself in a room like the other disciples in this passage. There's a suggestion that he is out and about living life. Furthermore, commentaries point out that Thomas wasn't necessarily doubting Jesus. He was doubting the disciples' story. You've probably had that experience before. A friend tells you a story that is just too incredible to believe. And even though you know and you trust that friend, you just can't quite accept what they're telling you. So you respond with, I'll believe that when I see it. But here's the most interesting thing to me, the suggestion that perhaps Thomas has a hard time believing them because they have been locked away with fear. Thomas seems to have a different understanding of what it means to follow Jesus and believe, and it doesn't involve being locked in a room, removing himself from the world. So when the disciples, who are too afraid to leave the house and follow Jesus, try to tell him about Jesus' appearance, he finds himself questioning their account. I can imagine him thinking, if that really happened, why are you still here, hiding in fear? And so Thomas doubts their account, and of course, Jesus appears again, corroborating their story. And Thomas, the one who has not been afraid, who has been out and about, acknowledges the resurrected Jesus. So, takeaways from this text. First, the disciples are afraid. Jesus appears and encourages them. He does not scold them. And a week later, they are still afraid. And again, Jesus appears and does not scold them. We are invited into a life that moves beyond fear. And God does not abandon us in our fear. This passage gives evidence of God's love for us, whether we are locked away in a room or are out and about. Second, Thomas's doubts and questions are also not corrected. Again, Jesus appears. He invites Thomas into encounter. And although the writer of John chose to reaffirm those who believe without seeing, which we need to remember would have been the audience, that the gospel was written for, Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas for his doubts or questions. Instead, he just offers Thomas reassurance. All this is to say there is room for all of it in our experience of faith. As we move through this time of transition in our country, as more and more people get vaccinated, and as the world opens up, there will be those of us who move back into an outwardly focused rhythm of life readily. There will be those of us who still feel most comfortable locked away from others. And then there will be all kinds of in-betweens. There is room for it all. God does not abandon us when we are afraid. 
God does not abandon us when we have doubts, and God does not invite us to judge one another's faithfulness or level of fear. Instead, God's steady presence remains, offering us peace and an invitation. As faithful followers who are afraid, courageous, doubtful, and certain, may we offer the same to one another and to the world around us as we navigate this hopeful and unsettling time in our history. Amen. Each week in worship, we pause for a moment of prayer. And in doing so, we are invited to share our joys and concerns with one another. We don't carry our prayers on our own, so we are able to share them in community with one another, knowing that God walks with us all. So I invite you to share your joys and your concerns in the chat if you are worshiping with us live. And if you would like to share a prayer concern with a pastor more privately, you are welcome to do so. Be in touch with us by texting or calling the church phone number 207-846-3773. This morning's prayer is written by Tom Schumann. Let us pray. Emptier of tombs, you raised Jesus from the grave, so all fears might be banished, so the locked doors of our hearts could be flung open, so our quivering lips could declare what we have seen and heard. And bright glory of God, as you stood in the middle of your friends on that first Easter night, come among us now in this time and place, showing us that death and sin no longer stand in the way of our life with you. Breath of peace, strengthen us so we may stand with all who fear life, Take our hands in yours so we may serve all who are broken with grief. Inspire us to share the grace which, was, which has been breathed into our very souls. God in community, holy in one, hear us as we pray the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. During Eastertide, we will be introducing our final hymns using excerpts from the book entitled Songs for Renewal, a devotional guide to the riches of our best-loved songs and hymns, written by Jane Lindeblad Jansen. She writes this about our next hymn. It was following a time of profound meditation on John 19, verse 41, through John 20, verse 18, that C. Austin Miles wrote in The Garden. In her book, The Secret Garden of the Soul, written around the same time as this hymn, Presbyterian journalist Emily Herman says this, quote, Every soul that is truly alive has a garden of which no other holds the key. A place where Jesus walks with his disciples and the clash of the world cannot drown out the music 
of his voice, end quote. The garden is a place of peace and rest, but it is also a place of life and growth. It shelters us and prepares us to go forth and bear fruit in the world. After precious times in the garden with God, Jesus went on living his life amid the noise, filth, and hostility of the crowds. In the garden, he received strength and health to minister to the sick and to the wounded, the lost and the sorrowing. Theirs is the voice of woe through which we perceive his voice. He calls us to come with him out of the garden and to bring life and beauty into a hurting and dying world. And so as we sing this hymn, may you meet the risen Lord again and receive strength and courage to follow Jesus' call into the world. As our time together comes to a close, I invite you to take another deep breath and take a moment and think about what is it that this time has given you? What is it that this time has given your spirit? Remember that you are a beloved child of God in a world full of God's beloved children. And remember that we are offered peace. May peace be with you as you go. Amen.